Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Kia ora, na mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Welcome to the special interview brought to you by Shearsies. My name is Alice, I'm the Equity Capital Markets Lead at Shearsies, and today I'm sitting down with Richard Umbers, who is the CEO of Ryman Healthcare. Ryman Healthcare provides retirement living and care in retirement village communities across New Zealand and Melbourne, Australia. Ryman Healthcare is listed on the New Zealand Stock Exchange and very recently announced a $902 million capital raise. We are having this conversation with Richard to help you get a better understanding about how Ryman Healthcare plans to use the funds from the capital raise, as well as Ryman Healthcare more generally. Just a note though, we won't be asking any specific questions about the capital raise as Richard is unable to respond to questions of that nature. Also, it's important to remember that investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor and you should review relevant product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Finally, Sharesies will be paid a fee for distributing the offer to Sharesies investors. And with all of that housekeeping out of the way, welcome Richard. Uh, Great to be able to join you, Alice. So to start things off, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background? So my name's Richard Umbers. I'm the group CEO at uh, Ryman Healthcare. I've been in the business for just over a year now, very much enjoying coming back to New Zealand after several years spent over in Australia. Can you give us a bit of an overview of Ryman Healthcare? I I love to hear from the company's leaders themselves about how they describe, you know, the company, its purpose, um, its operations and business model. Yeah, I guess the key uh, aspect of what we do is we're all about care. Good enough for mum and dad is our mantra. We're about delivering uh, quality of life and um, uh, first-rate care to people in later stages of life. Uh, We've been in operation for nearly 40 years with a market leader in New Zealand, and we've got a growing and very exciting business newly established over in Australia as well. Uh, We deliver what's called a continuum of care. And by that, what I mean is that uh, we offer independent living options, And then as people's lives progress right through into service department living, right through into three different levels of care, culminating in some very specialist dementia care, which I believe we probably offer some of the highest standards of uh, dementia care anywhere in the world. And last week, the big news was that Ryman Healthcare launched a $902 million capital raise. Can you tell us why you're raising this money and also what you plan on doing with that cash? Yeah, sure. Um, the most important thing is that um, this is a, a $900, million, $900 million raise, which is designed to reset our capital structure. And the reason we need to do that is we want to make sure that we have sufficient funds to be able to execute on our growth strategy. And in doing so, we're also going to pay down all our USPP notes and in doing so, reduce our debt. Debt has been a real topic of discussion over the uh, recent months and given the enormous opportunity that exists out there in terms of the aging population, Ryman is very, very well positioned to be able to take advantage of that market opportunity. But in order to be able to do so, we need the strength in our balance sheet. And so this $902 million raise is designed to reset the balance sheet and mean that we'll actually have the resources and the financial strength to be able to uh, front into this opportunity that sits ahead of us, both in New Zealand and Australia. And a unique thing about Ryman Healthcare is that this is the first time since listing on the New Zealand Stock Exchange back in 1999 that you're doing an equity capital raise, i.e. you're raising money from existing and new shareholders, whereas, um, as you've implied, you've typically used debt to fund your investments. You know, why now for an equity raise? Well, the first observation I, I would make is that um, – Uh, Previously, debt was quite cheap for a long period of time, and it made sense for us to be using debt as the primary source of our cash while we were expanding and and while debt was relatively cheap. We build what we would call a long-dated asset. It takes quite a long time for the constructions that we enter into to start throwing off cash and to start getting a positive return. While debt is cheap, it made sense to use debt as the funding instrument. And then in the fullness of time, we would get a return on that. We would, as we call it, recycle our capital which would then allow us to take the, uh, the the cash that we generate off that one we've just built and put that into the next one, add a bit more debt to it and continue to grow. Now, what's changed, of course, uh, over the course of the last couple of years is firstly, the um, 
COVID environment has significantly impacted the business. Obviously, uh, it impacts our health business, but more importantly than that, it impacts our construction business because the supply chains have been disrupted. Shortage of skilled labor has been an issue. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, but of course it's all related, is that the interest rates have gone up very, very significantly. And when those macroeconomic settings have changed, we think it's right to have another look at the capital structure. And it becomes apparent that it would be better to have more equity in the sources of funding rather than just debt flowing into the business. And so this is really born out of the macroeconomic changes that have taken place across the economy. And when those have changed, it makes sense for us to reset our capital structure. Mm, that's very interesting, um, you know, looking at how that macro environment um, impacts Ryman healthcare. And last year, there was some criticism in the media, you know, um, I read some articles in that, uh, that, uh, you know, Ryman healthcare was saying that the company's debt levels had gotten um, quite high. You know, what do you say to that? Well, I think in the, in the ben- with the benefit of hindsight, I think that's broadly right. Um, but it made sense to be using debt back then. And so we were deliberately taking on debt to fund our growth. And, and we were quite happy with higher levels of debt in more uh, tranquil times, I guess, when the markets were more predictable and when interest rates were low. What's changed is really that the interest rates have gone up. It now makes sense for us to press the reset button on that. And with hindsight, certainly in today's context, the debt levels were too high, which is exactly why we're raising 902 million in order to pay that debt down to get back to what would be a more, more sustainable level over the longer term. We've actually gone for a bracket of between 30 and 35%, and that would be um, a, a standard ratio for our industry. Most of the other players are in a similar bracket, and therefore it, it is much more falling into the norm of the rest of the sector. And I'm keen to come back to something you mentioned before, um, COVID-19 and labour shortages. Um, you know, I think it's very well recognised here in Aotearoa that there is um, a shortage of healthcare workers, of nurses. Um, what effect is that having on Ryman Healthcare? And perhaps more importantly, how are you responding to those challenges? Well, certainly labour has been an issue for us. In the first uh, case, obviously, with shut borders, uh, quite a significant portion of our workforce have been born overseas. And indeed, a large proportion of the nursing uh, staff that occupy not just within Ryman, but across the broader um, industry have are in fact uh, skilled labor. And a lot of them also come from offshore. So there was a really a national shortage of skilled labor, particularly in nursing and care. Uh, We tend to be good payers, we tend to be a favoured employer, so we perhaps suffered less than some, but we certainly felt the downward pressure or the the pressure on being able to find uh, skilled labour. But in actual fact, there is another part of our business. We're also a massive construction operation as well. And in the construction sector, uh, shortage of labour has also been an issue. And specialist skills like crane operators or specialist trades have also been very difficult to come by. And that has also had a significant uh, impact on our construction business as well. Mm, as you say, a lot of headwinds at the moment, um, rising interest rates, falling property prices, uh, labour shortages, uh, COVID. You know, and ultimately, as you mentioned right up front, Ryman is all about people. You're looking after our parents, our grandparents, and that's a huge responsibility. How do you make sure that their experience and care is front and centre, particularly in these tougher times? Well, care is, uh, is exactly what we do. It's our purpose. So everybody who works at Ryman fundamentally wants to do good in the world, wants to look after people. And we, we emphasize that mantra, good enough for mum and dad, in everything we do the whole time. We also have uh, um, uh, a significant number, like 10% of our workforce, which are made up of qualified nurses. And again, that has a significant influence on the culture of the business. We are fundamentally a business that is about care. So I suggest that that because that is so fundamental and core, that's been the one constant through all of this. The standards of care that we have been able to maintain through some of the most difficult of, of times is probably what has made us stand out. And in many ways, through the COVID crisis, our brand has actually strengthened because we've got such credit, I guess, for the remarkable achievements of the team. And our ability to keep people safe through some quite difficult times. So I would say that's been the one constant, actually, and it's very reassuring, uh, and all of us will fight to protect that aspect of the business. 
it's really the other aspects of the business that have really borne the brunt of those activities, and in particular, the construction business. You think we're, we're one of the biggest house builders or home builders in the country. This year, we're going to be delivering a 1,000 beds and units. And of course, that is a home for somebody, which then frees up where they're currently living for a new generation of people to move into and take those houses. So we play a, a important role in a health ecosystem nationally, but we're also part of the infrastructure of uh, keeping people homed or housed. And um, and that's these are all different aspects of the business. As you say, that construction part of the business is a huge part of what you do. Uh, can you tell us a bit about some of those investments? Uh, I know that you're building some brand new retirement villages. You've got banks of land for future development. Yeah, well, we've got 15 uh, construction sites on the go at the moment. I mean, it gives you some indication of the scale. We've got 45 operating sites now across both New Zealand and Australia with a market leader here in New Zealand, and we've got a rapidly expanding footprint over in Australia. Uh, with regard to the actual sites, we operate the full spectrum of care and independent living on every site, which means that when people buy into a Ryman village, they're not just buying for the moment in time that they move in, they're, they're buying in in anticipation of their needs changing over time. And quite often, a decision to move into a Ryman village will be the last real estate decision that somebody will take. They're effectively buying somewhere that they'll be able to stay for the rest of their days, but they've also bought the reassurance for themselves and for their family that they'll be looked after right through that whole uh, process, even if uh, they end up, I guess, in the very unfortunate situation of needing some quite specialist dementia care. So that has been our mantra throughout. Um, we've, we know that there is a huge opportunity in this sector because there's a demographic wave coming. The baby boomers are just a about now leaving work, they're entering the retirement stage of their life, and they're increasingly now starting to look for uh, retirement living options. Ryman offers a very high standard of care. They tend to be also a very wealthy cohort. The baby boomers are the richest generation in history, and our view is that they will have very high expectations of the standards of care that they're going to expect in later life. They'll be looking for the premium operator, and we position ourselves as the premium player in the marketplace. So we see this as a structural demographic tailwind, but one that will be reinforced by the wealth profile of those people who are retiring. And this is the reason why we think it's important to continue our expansion journey, why we need the financial strength to be able to act on that. There are still many, many towns, across, particularly across Australia, which are some distance from a Ryman village, and uh, we have therefore significant opportunity to expand. Because our buildings take such a long time to build, you know, six or seven years perhaps to bring a, a development to fruition. What we're building now is really an anticipation of the growth in demand some six, seven, eight years out. And um, focusing in on your Australian operations, because there's no denying that here in New Zealand, you're, you are very well established. You've, you've got retirement villages all across the country, but in Australia, you've really just focused on Melbourne. Why is that? And do you have any aspirations to expand beyond uh, Victoria? Well, the first observation I would make is that uh, in New Zealand, there are just over 5 million people, which is roughly the population also of Victoria. And uh, over in Victoria, we've still got uh, less than 10 operational sites. So there's still significant opportunity for us to go on expanding within the Victorian marketplace. It's a relatively wealthy market over in Australia, and we think that there is still uh, existing potential within our existing geographical area that we operate in. Now, beyond Victoria, obviously, there are other states which we could subsequently explore, but each time we would make a step like that, obviously, there's a significant new investment in the core infrastructure, and so that would be a big decision for us to make as a, as a company. I think the important thing for the uh, shorter to medium term is that we should be focusing on the markets where there already are significant opportunities, maximizing the the uh, outcomes of those locations before looking to new geographies. But you know, in the fullness of time, uh, who knows? I think the brand has experienced a very warm welcome into Australia. We're seen as something a disruptor. The market in Australia is structured differently. Pe operators are typically either care operators or independent living operators. What we've done with our continuum of care model. In Australia, they call that the Ryman model. So we put those two together and it's turning out to have competitive advantage in the marketplace and is being very, very warmly received. So again, 
the more resources we've got to be able to continue that expansion, the better we'll be positioned uh, to take on uh, the the challenge of the in, you know the, the the baby boomer wave, and also to be able to take on any com- competition that are entering the market also. And talking about that changing demographic and those uh, tailwinds for the industry, are there any examples of new technology that is helping your sector and, or could you see any major change in the next decade and how caring for elderly might look, might look different? Our version is, of care is very much centred around the human, um, both from a resident point of view and the carer. We place an awful lot of emphasis on one-to-one personal time, personal care, and we think that's the fundamental um, differentiator of, a, of an organization that cares for people properly. It's about human contact. We're not just talking about caring for people in a clinical sense. We're also talking about caring for people in an emotional sense. In fact, it's often said we build communities. We're not, we're not like a hospital, which is designed to mend you and allow you to go back out into the broader community. We are that community, and we want to look after you in a clinical context, certainly, but um, it's as much as about building a community as well. So it's quite a different concept from, um, as you would view, uh, perhaps a hospital. Is uh, just how how important technology is in helping people being able to uh, actually carry out that primary care function. Now, in its most obvious, uh, technology is playing an increasingly important role in the infrastructure that supports our nurses who are on the floor. They, for example, can walk around with mobile devices which contain all the patient records, which are able to allocate the drugs and reduce the risk of uh, anybody getting the wrong drugs and so on. So technology in any event plays a very important role in the administration and record keeping of a village. But perhaps the more exciting area is how technology is increasingly being applied to the actual care function. And um, it is interesting to see how various uh, treatments, say for dementia, using sound or light, or to be able to use uh, um, AI-based uh, technology and Alexa, for example, to be able to give people points of engagement and stimulation is a very, very exciting area in the industry. Uh, there are tools, for example, that have been widely publicized like PainCheck, which is a, you know, an app based on a mobile phone, which is able to interpret facial features from people and determine whether they're in pain when they're not in a position to be able to communicate. And this is the front edge, the leading edge of technology in, in a clinical sense. And I think it uh, is true to say that we're only at the beginning of the potential. We know that across the broader market, there's an awful lot of uh, private venture capital that's going into medical technology. And given the wealth of the baby boomers and those high expectations that I was talking about, there will be a ready market for people that come up with new technologies that are able to improve quality of life in later life. So we believe it's got enormous potential. We are involved in many different trials across the group looking at um, ways that we can utilize technology. It's not a substitute for care. It's something that helps you carry out care and achieve a higher standard and make it more relevant for the residents. It doesn't replace the human contact, but it's a very important part of making it a richer life. Uh, In fact, one of our other slogans that we use internally within the business is to promote a life that gets richer with age, and technology can play quite a role in achieving that. And uh, perhaps a more personal question before we start to wrap things up. What is it about Ryman and this sector that makes you want to come to work every day? Well, it's back to that sense of purpose, you know, that we started off with. I think everyone wants to make a difference. Ryman very much wants to make a difference, and we want to make a difference to people's lives. And a life that gets richer with age, uh, good enough for mum and dad, are great sort of guiding principles that help us shape what we do every day. And I'm thrilled to work for White Ryman. I'm privileged to lead an organization that is so focused on something that is so important. And I also look at my own parents and people that I know reaching those later stage in life. And I think society can do a whole lot more for them to give them much richer later years. And Ryman, I guess, is at the forefront of that. So it's a rare privilege to have the opportunity to lead an organization like Ryman. And before we go, is there anything else you'd like to say to people listening in? It's been fascinating to talk to you and um, most interested to sort of hear your thoughts in the questions. But Great to be able to talk about Ryman and uh, the great work that uh, our team do. We have, uh, in my view, uh, some of the most motivated and dedicated carers anywhere in the industry, and we achieve some of the highest standards anywhere in the world. And the brand that we've got is uh, a product, I guess, of the enormous strength of talent that we've got throughout the organization and the dedication to delivering uh, 
quality of care that's good enough for mum and dad. Well, thank you. And thank you so much again, um, Richard, for joining us today. We do really appreciate your time um, taking out of your busy day to chat to us and talking um, about Ryman Healthcare. Great to talk to you, Alice.